My name is Alex Hall, and today I'd like to talk to you about some research that my team and I um, have been doing on LA's climate future and what's coming with LA's climate and the choices that we face. We embarked on a long study over the past couple of years, it's still ongoing, to look at climate change in the Los Angeles region. Um, we downscaled a number of global climate models. We brought those climate models down to the neighborhood scale and we provided information about important climate variables. We examined climate for three different time periods. First of all, we looked at climate for what we call the baseline period, which is the last two decades of the 20th century. Then we examined a future time period in the middle of the 21st century. And then finally, we looked at um, a time period at the end of the 21st century, the last two decades of the 21st century. For the future time periods, we looked at two different emission scenarios. One scenario we call the business as usual emission scenario. That's a scenario where greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase at the same rate they have been increasing. We, the other scenario is called the mitigation scenario. In that scenario, greenhouse gas emissions are reduced over the coming decades. We examine the climate that changes by the year 2050 um, in some detail. We looked, for example, at the warming that takes place by this time period compared to our baseline period, which is the last two decades of the 20th century. We found that on the most likely outcome is there would be warming of something like 4 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit averaged over Southern California land areas. Um, the areas that are in the interior tend to warm quite a bit more than the areas that are near the coast. Um, so if you're in a region that's separated from the coast by one mountain range, typically those areas experience quite a bit more warming. Um, we also see that extremely hot days, days that are greater than in maximum temperature than 95 degrees, um, typically, see, um, um, typically happen two to three times more frequently by this time period in the future. We also see a significant reduction in snowfall in these high elevation areas of, of the Los Angeles region that do see quite a bit of snowfall in the current climate. Um, we see a reduction of something like, uh, something like one-third um, in most of, of high elevation locations. Um, we also see uh, changes in winds. We see a, uh, a reduction in the number of Santa Ana wind events. This reduction in Santa Ana wind events uh, drives a reduction in um, the fires that are associated with those events in the fall. However, we also see by, by um, the year 2050 a significant increase in the number of fires that occur in the summertime, and those are driven mainly by warmer temperatures. For the middle of the 21st century, the year 2050, we also examine the climate changes that occur in association with the mitigation scenario. In that scenario, we see significant climate change as well. For example, about 70% of the warming that occurs in the business as usual scenario also occurs under the mitigation scenario. And what this means is that climate change is inevitable. Even under the most optimistic circumstances where emissions are brought under control over the coming decades, we still see significant climate change in the region. And similarly, we also see reductions in snowfall in the mitigation scenario um, by the middle of the century, and we see changes in, in fire as well. So climate change adaptation is something that we have to confront in the Los Angeles region. The reason why climate change is inevitable by the year 2050 is that the climate system is still adjusting to the changes in greenhouse gas concentrations that have occurred over the past few decades. And in addition, it will take us time to convert our energy production to new forms of energy production. And so there are a couple of reasons why we have this long lag in the, in, in the, um, in the climate system and, and, and the um, forms of energy production that, that we currently have. And, and those combine to produce an inevitability to a changing climate. We also looked at the climate change outcomes that take place by the end of the 21st century, the last two decades of the 21st century. And at this point in time, we do see very significant differences between the business as usual em emission scenario and the mitigation emission scenario. Under business as usual, we see um, significantly more warming than even the warming that we see um, by the middle of the century, um, the year 2050. Um, we see the warming continuing at the same rate that, that it has, um, that is projected to continue over the coming decades, continuing to, to, um, to warm um, by the end of the 21st century. In the mitigation scenario, on the other hand, we see a 
uh, a leveling off of the warming, so that by the end of the century, the warming that, we, that materializes is about the same as the warming that we see by mid-century. So we do see benefits to mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, but those benefits don't materialize um, until the end of the 21st century. This body of research raises some really interesting questions about the choices that we face in the future. Uh, on, a, on a personal note, um, the, the question that comes to mind is, to me is, who are we really um, trying to benefit if we were to make decisions that would um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions? I think the, the research makes it clear that the benefits are going to accrue to, um, to people who are living on this planet at the end of the 21st century, not necessarily to our children, but more for our grandchildren. So the question that we have to address is, what kind of world do we want them to inherit? Um, that, that is, th those are the people that we have to think about when we think about whether we want to make efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. To find out more about this fascinating and complex subject, I encourage you to watch the full-length video of my Oppenheim lecture, which is hosted on the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability Oppenheim Lecture website.